how to say what we're saying so people can remember what we said. Here in video number three, we are going to discuss, we're going to continue how to start. That is, we're going to give you more mechanics and principles and concepts on how to put together your article, your book, your blog, such that you reach the audience in the most effective way possible. Now, in video number two, we discussed three things primarily under the auspices of how to start. We talked about what? Third party eavesdropping. <laughs> That's just being nosy from a distance, if you want to just say it in plain language. We also discussed first person eavesdropping. And then we discussed introspection. We talked about the power of each. But I just want to take one of these and and delve a little more before we get into the mechanics of how to start of today. Introspection. Introspection is so powerful. Let me just say that again. Introspection, writing from the angle of introspection is so powerful. If you concentrate, if you practice speaking from your heart without editing, that is saying what you feel without attempting to find a way to say it. Let me say that again. If you concentrate on saying what you feel without attempting to find a way to say it, that is, when you feel a certain way, say it the way you feel it. The grammar may be off, the syntax may be incorrect, but if the emotion is on, your reader will feel. Let me, oh boy, let me calm down. If your emotion is on, your reader will feel something. And what have we learned? People don't do something until they feel something. And if your reader feels something, your reader will keep reading. And we know that is what? The first purpose of our writing, the first law of the Ross writing method is what? To keep the reader reading. It doesn't matter how deep we are. It doesn't matter what we're saying later on. If we cannot keep the reader reading, all of our writing has been in vain. So when you leverage introspection, when you leverage the authenticity of your pure thoughts without perfecting them first, something happens. People start to relate to you in a different way, not because you are great in literature and you're a Pulitzer Prize winner and you are, you know, it's not that. People start to relate to you because you're saying what they only can think of that they didn't know they had permission to put on paper. The mistake most people make, writers, is they think what they should write, but then they change it before they write it. Let me say that again. They think what they should write, but then they change it before they write it. It's like, well, let me just, how should I say this? Have you heard that before? Have you been sitting down at a piece of paper and you're thinking about, let's see, this is what I want to say, but then you make the terrible mistake and you say, how should I say it? Not knowing you should say it just the way you thought it. When you say it just the way you thought it, people feel something, they keep reading, and when they feel something, you have something going on. So in addition to the strategies for starting, in addition to showing you what to do ABC, the technicalities of third person, first person introspection, I'm going to go out on a limb, and it is a calculated limb, and let me say this. Introspection is going to be your most powerful one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful methods for starting your book or anything you are writing. Introspection allows us to go in to your perspective. Introspection allows us to go into your perspective and it makes us feel privileged to hear something that our relationship or the lack thereof does, does not justify us hearing. It allows us to hear something and feel something that our relationship with you or the lack thereof does not justify us hearing or feeling. In other words, you have given us access to a special place and your reader will continue to read when you start off your paper with introspection because they're saying, wow, 
he or she has a, has admitted or has decided to put down the facade. They have decided to take the wall down. They have decided to not be perfect, but to just be true, man. And when you talk about being true, when you talk about your feelings, when you talk about the raw emotions you are having and you decide to put it on paper, I'm telling you, you win every time. You win every single time when you decide to put truth, authentic truth, not truth edited, but authentic truth on paper. I'm going to tell you just a slight story about that. And many of you who have attended my attended my seminars, writing seminars across the country, uh, some of you may have heard this. It has impacted me, and I'll, I'll see, if I say it once, you'll probably hear it again. I was teaching a class in Toronto. A gentleman who was quiet the whole time at the end raised his hand. And he had been listening intently, and I, I could tell he was not there lightly. He was, he was there he was there with something heavy on his shoulders. I didn't know what, but I could tell. So at the end of the session, he said, I have something to say. I said, yes. And he raised his hand and he said, I have a story to tell. He said, I have a story to tell, but I'm a nobody. And I talk about this all the time because it's so powerful. And I say it over and over because you have to get the power in what he said. He said, I'm a nobody, and nobody would want to hear what I have to say. I don't know what to write. And I said, you write just what you said. You don't go away from the authenticity of your emotions, your introspection, to then try to perfect the literature for publication. You go directly to what you just said. I'm a nobody, and I didn't want to write this book because I didn't think anyone would want to read it. And when that is your first sentence, I'm going to keep reading because I'm saying, wait a minute. You're telling me this gentleman has put himself out there like that. He has shown himself to be have the ability, the capacity to be honest enough to say something that's probably embarrassing to others, to say something that may ruin his reputation, because maybe in his office they think he's a confident young man. But he said, no, I'm really I really feel like I'm a nobody and I didn't want to write a book. You are now stepping on sacred ground because when you go behind the veil, guess what? You grab the hand of your reader and they walk behind the veil with you and disclosure encourages disclosure. Let me say that again. Disclosure encourages disclosure. And so what happens now when you are honest, I as a reader want to be honest too. And you have given me the key to my honesty through your honesty. This thing is magical, man. It's more than just start with this and say this and sequence and chronology and start. No, this thing comes down to being painfully honest enough to say, you know what? I didn't want to write a book because I kind of look at myself as being a nobody. Who would want to read a book written by nobody? Here's the answer. Everybody. Let me move on because this thing gets to me. It really does. Okay. Let me say one more thing introspection does. Please hear this. Introspection, writing from the perspective of how you really feel, not editing it, not trying to clean it up so it's palatable to the masses, not trying to make it uh, seem like you're so intelligent and deep and wise, and so you're using words you don't normally use. Introspection does this. It inspires, which is the most powerful form of human emotion you can translate to your reader, to your listener. Inspiration is so powerful because you never know what it's going to cause. Inspiration causes people to do things they never thought they could do, things they knew they should do intellectually but were never motivated to do it. And inspiration causes a person to say, I'm going to take the chance. What is inspiration? To perspire means you're sweating on the outside, 
but to inspire means you're sweating on the inside. Inspiration means you've caused a person to sweat internally. People who are inspired many times quietly go about doing something really big in silence because they're inspired. You can't see the sweat. The sweat is on the inside. When you write from a perspective of introspection, you inspire or you cause someone to sweat on the inside. And when you cause a person to sweat on the inside, man, heavy things happen. They come to you after finishing law school. They come to you after finishing medical school. They come to you after whatever it is needs to be fixed in their life, taking some, taking some broken pieces and putting it back together, not because you know, they had a, a Yahoo moment and they're running around and telling everybody about what they're doing. No, inspiration works quietly. The loudest inspiration sometimes ever becomes is a tear running down your cheek. Inspiration is quiet motivation. And when you use introspection and you write from the perspective of being honest, you inspire someone else to be honest, and a person is dangerous when they become honest with themselves. My, my, my. When you become honest with yourself, there is nothing you cannot accomplish. Honesty is the fuel of productivity. And when you say, I'm going to write from introspection so people can be inspired to be honest, and speak and write and present also from a perspective of, in, of introspection, you can change the entire world, man. Just with a blog, just with a book, because people will read it and say, wow, I never looked at life that way, or I've had this same feeling, but I didn't have the courage to say it. He, she has now given me the courage with their perspective of introspection, they have now inspired me to go and do things I was too scared or had not the courage to do. I can now do it. Okay, I know, we gotta get to how to start. Okay, let's get to some of the more mechanics. We are back, I just had a moment of inspiration myself, so I had to just calm down because I'm just so excited about language and what to write and words and their power. So let's get into, get back into how to start, continuing our video number two. We're going to cover this time some of the mechanics, some of the mechanics of writing that you can use to start your writing, start your book, your blog, your article. What are these mechanics I speak of as we continue? Mechanics are a proven sequence to generate consistent results. Mechanics are a proven sequence to generate consistent results. In other words, when I understand mechanics, I can hit the target almost every time because mechanics are not emotions, although they may generate emotions. Mechanics are not necessarily uh, on the whim of the day and how you feel and how you don't feel. When you generate mechanics, the engine starts because your car is a machine, and because that machine was made by what? Mechanical engineers? It doesn't matter when you sit down whether you're crying in the front seat, whether you're happy, whether you just gained a job, lost a job, whether you just broke up with someone or not. When you put the key into the ignition and you turn it, the car starts because mechanics are at play. Whether you are happy or sad, the engine does not take an account for that because mechanics work a proven sequence to generate consistent results. And so we want to use mechanics in our writing because over and over and over, no matter how the person reading feels and no matter how much the, how the person who is writing feels, the mechanics work every time. Let's get into mechanics 101. Now, here is a way you can start your writing, no matter what the collateral may be. Take two words that are independently understood but have never been paired together to start your narrative. 
Here is an example. A diagnosis is like a divorce. Hmm. What does that mean? It means I have taken two words. We understand them separately. There's no need to explain to an adult what a diagnosis means. There's no need to explain a divorce. But here is the magic of these two words. Rarely, if ever, have you ever seen them used together in a sentence, which then makes your reader say, how are they alike? Which opens a veil. It opens ah, that door, that Disney door to Narnia again. It says, if he or she has made a relationship between two things I understood separately, and they are about to tell me something that is alike between the two, what does this do? Back to our method number one. It keeps the reader reading to see how you have made such an association. When you take two words independently understood, what you have done is said, I have something new to show you. Now let's continue this sentence. Let me show you what you could do with this. A diagnosis is like a divorce because parents are married to the idea of having healthy children. Do you see what I did there? I allow two things, two words, two concepts unalike to show by a sentence after that, how they are akin. And by doing that, your reader says, hmm, interesting. I see what he means now. And this allows me the opportunity to do what? To hold their hand and take them to the next concept. Because what? When you, man, mm, mm, mm. when you show a person you have a different perspective on things they already understand, they will see if there's anything else they could understand better and continue to follow your reading, continue to read. Let's go to the second example. Never underestimate the frequency of rare events. Interesting, isn't it? Why is this so interesting? Because frequency and rare have nothing in common. In fact, they are antonyms. They have nothing to do with each other. In fact, they are the opposite. Because if something is rare, it can't happen frequently by definition. So what have we done here? We have created a definitional predicament where we now must show the reader how we can take something that is nothing alike and show that they have commonalities. This is the magic of taking two things independently understood and pairing them together to start a narrative. We're talking about how to start and how to begin your story in a way where something can occur in the mind of your reader that disallows them from disengaging your text. Now, this particular phrase was used for a client of mine, a firm who was trying to secure a large monthly retainer from a publicly traded company. And long story short, the company said, why should we retain a crisis management firm? How often will a crisis occur? Why don't we just call you when something happens? And not to tell you the entire story, but the argument was made that if a crisis hits the media over a certain period of time, the dilution of their share price would cost them hundreds of millions of dollars if it was not taken care of immediately, if we didn't have something in place to take care of it immediately. And so what are we, are we really saying? Never underestimate the frequency of rare events. What we are really saying is never underestimate the liability of rare events. But using somewhat of a clever turn of a phrase, the frequency of rare events, what we're saying is, you don't know how often a crisis will occur, but it may happen more often than you think, which opened the door for them to then do a calculation on how a crisis could really be bad for the shareholders. And so paying this crisis management firm 50,000 a month, which at first seemed to be exorbitant, all of a sudden seemed reasonable because they are buying insurance off of a dilution that could eventually cost them hundreds of millions of dollars. Let's go to the next example. Plans don't work, mistakes do. I have used two words again. Plans and mistakes, again, don't seem to have any correlation. 
because of course, you're planning so that things unplanned don't necessarily happen. Now, of course, there is admittedly not as opposite an example as we have with frequency and rare in our last example, because we all understand we can make a plan and a mistake can still happen. But, but I've gone beyond that. I've gone into the connotation. I've gone into, we all have all made plans, but how often do these plans work the way we have designed them to? I've actually gone the next step and said, more often it is mistakes work better than plans. That something we have planned to happen can actually cause something else to happen we did not plan. And I'm classifying that here connotatively as being a mistake. Plans don't work, mistakes do. We all have made a plan and only to find out that, you know what? The plan I wrote this piece of paper on, the paper is worth more than the plan <laughs> because something else occurred that was more valuable than what I planned to occur. So I hope you can excavate out of this particular mechanics number one example and think in your own writing. How can I take two things understood by the masses independently and put them together in a sentence to open a door to a different understanding to do what? Keep the reader reading to engage them in a way that is so deeply tied they cannot disengage. Look over this in your own reading, in your own writing, and, and see where you can apply this. Let us go to Mechanics 201. This is what I call in my classes thoughtful hyperbole. Thoughtful hyperbole. What I mean by this is, and of course, this really goes back to something I used in Mechanics 101, if you can, if you can uh, see the connection. Hyperbole is considered to be obviously exaggeration. Thoughtful seems to be something that connotes a bit more honesty. We can look at it that way, a bit more honesty. Thoughtful tends to, what does it do? When I say thoughtful, it seems as if you have considered what you were going to say before you said it. Hyperbole seems to be something that is haphazard, something where a person exaggerates in the in the heat of the moment. <laughs> and so I'm putting these two words together, actually combining mechanics one-on-one -on -one with 201. Thoughtful hyperbole. What do I mean by this? Example number one, he walked in the room taller than his height. Hmm, wait a minute. He walked in the room taller than his height. Now, do you see what I'm doing here? Height by definition means how tall you are but I'm creating a definitional predicament and I'm causing you to think connotatively, not denotatively. I'm causing you to see into a person's character, not their physique. He walked in the room taller than his height. So what am I saying? You see a person who is confident. You may see a, a person who's arrogant. You may see a person who uh, is wealthy or you may see a person who, you have seen this type of person in your life but now what I've done is I've just added words to what you only thought. I've given you a lexicon to your private thoughts. He walked in the room taller than his height. Interesting, isn't it? Conversely, we have seen someone who walks in a room shorter than their height. And we would what relate that to someone who was not confident, someone who does not have the self-assurance as another person. Interesting, isn't it? Let's go to the second example. The second example is this. Life is different when you're expected to die. Do you see what I've done? I have taken life and die, which of course, the two cannot exist at the same time. Philosophically, they can, of course, but we're speaking just only from the perspective of, of literature and communication. Life is different when you're expected to die. This was an example I used in a project I was working on, written for someone who run, wanted to write a book on dealing with and managing terminally ill children. How do you manage and properly care for, as a parent, a terminally ill child? Now, we could have just recited all of the stats and of this particular disease the child was, was dealing with. and the care and the health insurance. No, 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 no. That's not what makes someone feel something. 
That would have been a research report. No one cares. If we want people to care, we have to speak from the perspective of caring. So what did I do? I took the child's perspective. I wanted to write the book, not from the parent. So the book is written for parents, but I wanted to write it from the perspective of the child. And so I took the child's perspective. And I said, you know what? Child's in a wheelchair and I, I gave this sentence, life is different when you're expected to die. You feel the slight reduction of enthusiasm when your parents introduce you to their friends. Here is Meredith, our oldest daughter. She's on her way to college. He's, here's John, he graduates high school next year. He's looking to, to go off to school also. And, and here, here's Bobby, say hi, Bobby. And Bobby, the sick one, said, what you really feel is, here's Bobby, he'll be, he'll be dead soon. Life is different when you're expected to die. He says, you hear things people don't even say. Do, do you see what we're doing here? We're, we're, we're taking, there goes the chills, we're taking thoughtful hyperbole. We are exaggerating and in some cases not even exaggerating because you know these are true feelings that someone in that position may feel but generally speaking we're taking situations real situations in life and expanding them beyond the parameters of our current understanding and we're going into areas untapped sacred areas areas of the mind so a person can see how it feels not to be them Oh, we know what it feels like to be ourselves, but the key is taking someone using introspection, using, using thoughtful hyperbole, using independent words understood but never paired together, using all of this and showing someone a different life, a life they have not lived so they can appreciate and understand deeper things that they have never experienced. Man, let me go forward. I'll get stuck there. Whew. Mechanics 301, give words to wordless places. Giving words to wordless places. Mm. All of this is connected. If you, when you really look at this, all of this is connected. What does it mean to give words to wordless places? Hmm. You know what it means. You know your most impactful moments in life have happened in wordless places. There's no language down there. There's no language. You can feel it, but there's no words that can express it. A tear comes the closest thing to words when you're talking about places that are untraveled, except for the lonely traveler experiencing the experience. Words to wordless places. Let's look at the first example. The first example is, it's a bit fun to me, and I always find this to be interesting when I teach it in person in my seminars because the men in the room always look at this sentence and come away with something so differently than the women do. It's just a fascinating study in gender, and I've done this so many times in so many cities, I can tell you exactly what the women are going to say and what the men are going to say. Through my toes, I watched her get dressed. Hmm. My question always in my seminar is, who do you think she is? Does this sound like a man's wife, his girlfriend? Is he supposed to be there with this woman or this is someone who is not supposed to be in his presence? What is the connotation of this sentence? I didn't tell you who she is at all, and I did not tell you where she is. I just told you, he was watching her get dressed. And in that, men, just speaking about men right now, often will think about, hey, wait a minute, I've, I kind of know what he's talking about. Your, your feet are elevated. You're kind of looking through your toes, and there she is. And wow, I've experienced that. I've never articulated it, but I have experienced it. I know what, what you're talking about. And then I asked the ladies, well, who is she? And, you know, many times a, a lady in my seminar will say, well, that's his wife. Or many times, you know, that's his. But men are saying, no, I would not have spoken about my wife in such romantic terms. I wouldn't have said it that way. So it's always just funny. 
But, but here's the point. The point is, notice the questions you have just because I made a statement. I didn't tell you she was in a bathroom, but somehow many people think she is. I didn't tell you she was nude, and, but somehow people think she is. The reality is she could be getting dressed. She could be putting on a, a sweater or a coat. Um, uh, I didn't tell you the gentleman was in the bed, but somehow people think he is. Uh, I didn't tell you that uh, there are a lot of things. This goes in, the, in a lot of different directions, but I didn't tell you any of those things. This is why it is so powerful to understand the mechanics of how to start, because you cause a person to engage collaboratively in your writing, but you've said none of what they're thinking. Through my toes, I watched her get dressed. A gentleman's in bed, his feet are on a pillow, the woman's in front of him getting dressed, and it's not his wife. <laughs> but I didn't say any of that. He really could be at a park. His feet could be up on uh, a little rise on a little hill he's on. She could just be coming out of the water somewhere and she's getting dressed because she has a bikini on. A lot of things could take place, but the magic is you make a person think and insert their own interpretation you make them insert their own interpretation. You understand how to say things that say a lot without you saying them. This is a mechanic. Let's talk about the second, second thing on the screen here. On my second bite, I thought of something. Now, this actually leans into obvious writing, which is something we talk about next. We've many times been thinking about something heavy or something's weighing heavy on our mind, either at the office or at home or whatever go get a bite to eat. And on our second bite, we think of something. We think of the answer. So we take our food and we rush back to the office and to tell people about the answer we just thought of, or, or we may uh, you know, go back to our computer and, and type it out and send an email. The point being this, we all have experienced this in some way, shape, or form. The magic is expressing it so someone can say, I know what he or she is talking about. Let's move on to Mechanics 401. Power of obvious writing, the power of obvious writing. This is very interesting because you've probably been able to notice there is a theme here that is authenticity, the introspection angle, uh, the angle of thoughtful hyperbole, uh, the angle of independent words understood separately but not used together. When you talk about the power of obvious writing, you're really saying what everyone knows and everyone has thought of, but no one has written down. <laughs> we know this is true, but no one has said it. And so this first sentence here, it says, it's hard to lead somebody when you're lost. Well, you know, okay, Sherlock, this is not something we are revealing that is so philosophically deep or you know, causes someone to have a postgraduate degree to, to understand. But it is powerful because it is so obvious. That is the power of obvious writing. Saying things everyone knows, but no one has really written it down. It allows someone to smile. It allows them to say, well, that's, uh, yeah, that's true. It allows them to keep reading because you have gotten a nod out of them. You've said something that allows them to stay engaged at least a little longer to see what else you're going to say that allows them to say, hey, never thought of that, but I knew that. I knew that. Well, better said, I never saw that written, but I've thought of that. That's the better way to say it. So here are Mechanics 101, Mechanics 201, 301, 401, which all play into how to start the mechanics, as we said earlier, when you deal with mechanics, you're dealing with something that deals with being consistent on a consistent basis. You're dealing with something that allows you to be effective on a consistent basis. The mechanics, turning the key and the ignition in acts, engages the mechanics of the car. Doesn't matter the emotions of the driver, the car still comes on. When you use these types of mechanics in your writing, the writing, as it were, comes on and runs well because you understood how to separate yourself from the emotions of writing 
and ironically engage them in another way by using the mechanics of writing. It's just a different way of getting to the same place. Now, if you finished video two and here at the end of video three, you may be saying, wait a minute, Dennis, you talked about talking about something else in the last video. That is what? Emotional misdirection and the economy of expression. I did not forget. We're going to go into those things next. We're going to cover emotional misdirection. We're going to cover the economy of expression. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed recording it. It's been some really exciting information here. I, I ask that you take this information and contemplate it further. Take this information and use it to start your writing so the person reading cannot stop reading. Okay, I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.